This is Jay Krishnamurti's 10th discussion with teachers and students at Brockwood Park, 1975. The usual question, what should we talk about? You want to discuss, talk about that? Fear and death? In meditation? We also talk about meditation. I don't know what, I forgot it. What were we talking about? Relationship, I think. What? You came to the point where you started discussing relationship and we stopped. Can we talk more about silence and the observer and the observer? Ah, yeah, that's right. We're talking about <clears throat> what is silence, whether there is silence, if there is the observer, and what is the art of listening, seeing and learning. And we want to talk this morning about <coughs> the fear, would it interest you to discuss fear? When we get angry and annoyed at uh, circumstances and other people, what does that tell us about ourselves? When we get angry, <coughs> when we get angry about ourselves, about something, what does it tell us? What does that anger indicate? Have you been angry? Hmm? Very angry? What do you mean by that? Being very angry, what do you mean? Wanting to hit back, hit somebody? Make a violent gesture? Feel out of yourself? What does that indicate? What is anger? To be angry. What is the meaning of that word? The root meaning of it. I've looked it up. I'm a bit lost. To suffer. To suffer. What, what does it indicate <clears throat> that my image of myself has been terribly hurt and I retaliate against that person or that thing or environment or the circumstances which has hurt me and therefore I feel a, hmm, violently, adrenally <laughs> furious? What? It, it can also be that one has suppressed something and then it's at the top where you cannot suppress anymore. You suppress something and then burst out. Is that anger? Or is anger something against which you violently react? I tell you something which you don't like which hurts you, and you retaliate by getting angry with me.
which is part of that fear and hurt, right? The fear of getting hurt more and resisting or building a wall against that, against being further hurt. And the reaction to being hurt is anger. Would you call that? Would you say that? Oh, yeah. hmm? So fear is involved in it, isn't there? Fear of being hurt. There is the physical fear of being hurt. Being run over by a car, surgery, toothache, and the tooth having to be pulled out, and so on. Physical, <coughs> organic hurt. Not all, organic hurt. And, and psychologically, inwardly, we get hurt. You may not talk about it, you may not show it. You may not show it even in your eyes, but you get deeply hurt, right? And either you retaliate, hit back, hmm? because you you don't want to be further hurt, and therefore you are be you are afraid of getting more hurt, right? All that indicates the nature of myself, doesn't it? How I resist any form of psychological hurts. All right? Would you go along with that? And <clears throat> you want to discuss the fear of death hmm? and meditation and something else. You want to discuss that fear of death on a cold, lovely morning? Kisko <laughs> Boshi. Mm, so is that right? I mean, does it interest you? Seriously? To find out why one is afraid of death. Does it really interest you? Or you want to be amused by it? Or to be informed about it? Let's talk about it a little bit first. In India, the Hindus, when they, when there is death, I've never been present at a death, but I watched from the streets and I walked in a procession with one man carrying his, carrying in a pot far, and two people were carrying his father behind. He was a Brahmin walking with his sacred thread, naked except up to here, and carrying. <coughs> a pot, earthenware pot, in which fire was burning. And behind him was the dead father, washed, clean, clean cloth, and came. Nothing else. Follow? You understand? There was no procession, there were no cars, there were no Rolls Royces, <laughs> flowers, a long procession. And <clears throat> I followed them beyond the beach and further along, along the beach. There, they had a pile of wood they had already collected. They put the body on that pile, on that wood, and the, from the pot, the son, who was the eldest son, lit the fire. Right? Are you interested in all this? 
That's history. Just be amused by it. And also I've seen far a death in Benares. You know where Benares is? On the banks of the Ganga, Ganges. And everybody thinks if you die there or burnt there, you are washed away, wash away all your sins. So you see them coming from different villages on bicycles, dead, dead bodies being carried on bicycles, on half carts, on camels have seen it. And there they burn it. And the poor people generally have to get back home. So they buy wood and they see it being burnt and they leave. And the people who own the wood, who sell the wood, throw the body in the river and sell that wood over again. You follow? And <clears throat> the ancient Egyptians buried, especially if you are an important person, in caves, in the pyramids, in the Tutankhamun, you've heard of him, of course. There, they, there, they said, he will live after death. Because, and so they surround him with all the things he's used to, the chair he sat on, and so on, the play, and everything he was used to. They put that in the cave, seal it up, and they were, and most of the caves have been robbed. And the idea being that they will be, <coughs> that they will live at another level of life with all the things they are used to. And the Christians have their own ideas, which is that you are physically you are resurrected when Gabriel blows the horn and you're all up there sitting next to God on a cloud. It's all, you may laugh at it, they're all part of the same thing. Do you remember that, two, that joke, two men sitting on a cloud with wings? One says to the other, I just wanted to drive that Cadillac which I bought the other day, but unfortunately before I could drive it, I died. But here they seem to accept that that Cadillacs was all right. <laughs> you understand? And so the Muslims bury their dead. And the Parsis, you know, you've heard of Parsis, who were driven out from Persia, which is Iran, or oh, many centuries ago, um, by the Muslim invasion, I think I've forgotten now, and they went to India. They settled there. They are called Parsis. They, when they, and a Parsi dies, and a Parsi worships far, earth and air. So he doesn't want to pollute the things of the earth, air, or far. So when the body dies, they expose it in a particular place so that the vultures eat it up. Is that all right? You've understood all this? So there are these various forms of disposing of the body disposing the body in various forms, according to various beliefs, various conditionings, various forms of fear. Right? Now, what do you... You must have seen death, haven't you? Hers, in a car, in a, and so on. You have seen death. What do you think of death? What does death mean to you? You see a bird being killed by a car, or a stoat 
yesterday Vispa killed a stoat which was holding on to a rabbit. Hmm? Yes. One thing living on another. So, what do you, when you look at all this, various forms of disposing of disposing the body in India, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Catholics, and the various forms of getting rid of the body. What do you think of this death? What does death mean to you? To me, I sense it's a distinction between death when the time is right, in the sense a person dying of natural causes of old age, what have you, and the type of death you see, such as a child dying from... Yes, child dying from starvation, child dying from disease, and so on, so on, so on. There's a difference in the one I feel is in the place of. Oh, one is the natural form of death, which really rarely happens nowadays. Well, you die by through accident, through disease, through crippled old age, becoming unconscious, and dying gradually, or there are very few that die naturally, easily, happily. Hmm? I used to know a man, he's dead now, he called his family together and said, I'm going to die on such and such a day. This is accurate, I'm telling you what, was hap- what happened when I was there in that house. He was a friend of mine. And he said, I'm going to die on the 25th or whatever that date was. He called his family together and said, July the 25th, I'm going to die. And on July the 25th, they all gathered in his bed. He was quite healthy. He turned over and died. All that, the child, innocent child, killed by a bomb in Vietnam or in the past two wars. There are children dying in Africa of starvation, children dying of disease and all, and all kinds of things happening to them in the East. So there is that kind of death. But I'm not talking the child's death or the natural death or the death through disease, but what does it mean to you to die? When you see the body being carried in a hearse, covered with flowers in a coffin, which is expensive, you know, all the business of it, what do you think of death? What does death mean to you? It's like a, a feeling of just a sort of a morbid feeling. Just no, 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 no. You see that that person huh, in the hearse. What does it mean to you? How do you react to it? Huh? It makes me wonder, what is life? What is, what is this life? No, 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 I'm not worth asking you what is it all about. You see that person dead, in the hearse, carried out, buried, and all the business of it. What does it, how do you react? What does death mean to you? Well, that's going to happen to me one day. Ah, yes, proceed. It's going to happen to you one day. We're all going to die one day, naturally, happily, or unhappily, unconscious, knocked down by a car, disease, or all the rest of it. Now, what does it 
you're going to die. What does that mean? Go into it, sir. Don't inquire, learn about it. Do you say, well, I've had a jolly good time in this life, that's enough, and die. Or what a wretched life I've had, and what an awful business it all is, and I'm glad I'm going to die. Hmm? I've had long uh, trouble, physical trouble, heart, <coughs> heart trouble, disease, prolonged disease, or senility, old age, when you lose your memory and you repeat and repeat and repeat and you t ask them, they ask you something and they ask you the same thing ten times off. So there is all this phenomena going on. Hmm? Right? And you see it. What, what does death mean to you? Or is it too, you're not concerned with it? It's too far away, too young. You're too young to even to consider what it means. You ask for it. Hmm? My mother dies, my son dies, and I see somebody dying. I saw once a, a man I used to know, they called me to his house, and he was dead. And there was flies sitting on him, and I wanted to brush him off. <laughs> Instinct, I said, for God. And I realized he didn't feel a thing, and he was dead. What does it mean to you? My son dies, my brother, and I shed tears. I weep. Why do I weep? Huh? You're never going to see that person. And so you weep. Hmm? Are you weeping for that person or for yourself? Huh? I weep for myself. Go slowly. Think it out. You see, you're, you're, going, you're weeping for yourself. What does that mean? You have lost, I have lost my son, or my brother. I shed tears. For whom am I shedding tears? For the brother, for the son, for the mother, whom I shall never see? Or am I crying for myself because I have lost something? So I've lost something, therefore I cry. Is that it? That's the one that you really, you really love. Yes. I really love my brother, or my son, my mother, father, whatever it is. And I cry. I feel terribly upset. I'm in despair. And I begin to feel lost. Hmm? So I cry. I want to find out for whom I am crying. For the for my brother who was who could have lived much more intelligent than I am, much more com greater capacity, greater etc. But and he was my brother and he died and never lived to do what he wanted to do. Therefore I cry. For him as well as for myself. Hmm? Go on, think it out, Lady. One fact is 
that he's gone or she's gone. When you lose something, what happens to you? When you lose something that you that you love, that you, that's precious to you, that you want to hold, that you want to keep, that you want to, you know, have with you always, and you lose it, what happens to you? Hmm? Empty. So you feel empty because you lost something? I'm not saying you are wrong, you're quite right, but I want to go into it. I lose my watch, hmm? and that watch has been given to me by a friend, and I've kept it for forty years, which is a fact. I've got a watch, forty years, and I lose that watch. Somebody takes it away, steals it, or I lose it by my negligence, laziness, and I. Hmm? I won't cry over that, hmm? unless I'm silly. I feel I've lost it. I'm too bad. I, I could. Have, I would like to have it given to somebody rather than lose it. That's one kind of loss. Then I lose my house, hmm? my job. I don't cry too much about it. I feel, you know, Lord, I built this house, I have to now start it all over again. You know, I feel upset. I feel the work which I have spent on it is wasted and so on. And I lose my money, and I need money. So I am again upset about it, right? And I lose my mother. But my mother is different from my wife. <laughs> right? I don't I weep. I feel very sad. She was she brought me up, she loved me, she looked after me. But I cry, but it's a different kind of mm, sadness, right? Are you following all this? But if my wife dies, or my son dies, I'm much more upset. Have you noticed this? Have you? Why? The watch, the house, the mother, the wife and the son. The wife and the son are much more upset than losing a watch, the house, the mother, the father. Why? Go on, son. Answer it. Discuss it. But you were living with people. And huh? You were living with. Why were you saying? There was a sense of security. They were, you know, you, were, you had something to hold on to. Uh, they, you know, they were there. You loved them, uh, and sort of this was a feeling of well, everything was no, in its right place. Very happy. I'm down to my question. I lost my watch, my house. That's one thing. Why I lose my mother? Hmm? I lose my father. If I lose my father, it won't so much matter. <laughs> I'm sad, but my mother. I'm little more sad, right? But if I lose my wife or my son, daughter, I get much more upset. Why? Because I'm very much dependent on my wife. Security. Is that it? Dependence on your wife for pleasure, for comfort, 
for sex, for carrying on, looking after the house, hmm? uh, bearing children. So is that the reason why I cry more? And for the son, you want the son to be um, better than you are and to do... Is that the reason why I cry more? I am much more sad? So tell me, I, why do I... It's a fact, isn't this? is a fact, isn't it? Hmm? Have you noticed this? What? Have you noticed this? Yes. Why? Is it? I'm attached to my wife. All the implications of being a wife or a husband, much closer, much nearer, more the great habit involved in it. Hmm? Right? Coming home from her work, there she is cooking and all the rest looking after my house, right? Thoroughly domesticated animal. Hmm? Right? And the, that sense of loss brings a great feeling of insecurity, doesn't it? Hmm? Right? Are you following all this? Does this interest you? You're going to be one day wife, so listen to it. I lost somebody on whom I depended, much more than I depended on my mother. Hmm? So I feel a sense of void, emptiness, loneliness, right? A sense of sudden lack of communication, sudden feeling of being cut off from everything. Why should that be? Why should that feeling be so much greater for... I'm going to go into it a little bit. I'm <laughs> Suddenly cut off feeling great sense of loss. Right? Are you following all this? Great sense of utter feeling of having lost all relationship with the world. I may go to the office or to the factory or some business, but their relationship is different. This relationship is something was intimate, strong, dependent, and suddenly have lost. Hmm? And this sudden feeling of loss indicates that I'm I'm very lonely. Right? And this loss indeed shows me how how dependent I have been, hmm? and I must go back and depend on somebody else. Right? And I feel great sense of loneliness. Hmm? That loneliness was always there, but I covered it up with my wife, with my job, with my loan, with my golf, with my tennis, with chattering, with worship of God, going to church, <laughs> reading a lot of books and being able to talk cleverly. I covered it all up, that immense loneliness, right? 
and the wife dies, I'm suddenly faced with this. I'm frightened. My mother dying is different. Right? I, the cause of my suffering, of my shedding tears with wife is quite different because I have lived with her, dependent, she was me and I was her, and she did everything for me and I did things for her. Cook and sex and children and worry. We shared things if we had, if we had good relationship. Hmm? And you take that away from you. Death takes it away from me. And that is the one of some of the major reasons why I suffer more than when my mother dies. Or my father dies, or my uh, distant <coughs> uncle dies. Mm-hmm. So I realize I am crying not only for my wife, also much more for my own loss. Mm-hmm. For it is a form of self pity. It's a form of self agony. Are you bene? Are we going on together? No? So I realize all this and I say to myself, what is death? I shall die one day, and if I have a son, grown up, he say, oh, well, poor old dad, he was a nice boy. Hmm? <laughs> he helped me a lot, he put me through school, he beat me up sometimes, but that's all right, but he's dead. Hmm? And I say to myself, what is death? I shall die, we'll all die. People have been killed by the million in millions in the war. Hmm? Are you f- hmm? <coughs> so what is death? The ending of being. Huh? The ending of being. The ending of being. Now, what do you mean, please listen carefully, what do you mean by ending and being? Think it, don't quickly answer, look at it carefully. Look at the question, which is, what do you mean by ending? <laughs> you know, ending has a great significance. I don't know if you realize what ending means. It's got a tremendous significance. Ending and continuing. Right? You see that? Something that continues, a tradition, hmm? being in English, being in Hindu, oh, I worship God, I'm all, a tradition, which, which means tradare, to hand down, hand over. Right? You, hmm? It's very, very interesting if you go into this. A thing that continues hmm? either horizontally or vertically is 
it can never receive anything new. Right, sir? Something new can happen only when there is an ending. Hmm? Right? If I am always a Catholic till I die, I am a Catholic, or a Hindu, or a Muslim. That's continuing. A communist, I'm all my life a beastly communist or beastly something else. But, but if I end my, some, my dependence or my saying I'm a communist, I'm a communist, or something new can take, and there can be a new perception. You understand? So ending has got tremendous meaning. Right? Do you see that? That means, can you, listen carefully, can you end each day, not carry over yesterday to today? What's the guarantee that new will happen? What? I, I'm, not, I'm not guaranteeing. There is nothing guarantee. <laughs> it's not an insurance or a. ending is on account of that. Ah, no, I see, I mustn't go too much into this, I see the fact that where there is an ending, there is a new beginning. Hmm? If I carried on with a propeller engine, piston engine, hmm, for flying, and I said, that's enough. Don't, don't talk to me about anything else. Hmm? But the man who invented the jet, he had to say, yes, that's all right, propeller is all right, but that, let me put it aside and look at something. You follow? So he discovered something new. So ending has tremendous depth to it. That is, if I can end what I did yesterday, what I thought yesterday, and, and yesterday evening stop everything, finish with yesterday, then today is something totally afresh, isn't it? I don't know if you see it. You see it, sir? And can you do that? end with my moods, end it. Yesterday I was moody, finished. Not so well, I'm still moody the next day. If I'm gossipy, if I'm uh, something or other, finish with it, end it. So each day, the, the, as the day dies, so you the things of yesterday die with yesterday. Do you understand all this? <laughs> Poor people, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the way to live. And you say, what is being? You said, death is the ending of being. What do you mean by being? Go on, sir, look at it, go on. Being. Huh? Being. being. No, no, not something. No, no, being. No, you, you know. <laughs> the tree doesn't say, I am being. The animal that whisper doesn't say, well, I am being.
Is there, listen, find out, is there anything that, that is being or becoming? Is this too much? Little bit. <laughs> I listen. I no. <laughs> that pine tree was very small when it was planted, and it was growing. Becoming. And you, when you are small, you are growing. And as you grew, you are becoming. You are, say, I must be this, I must be that, I must be. And they grow, becoming all the time. You never say, I'm being. Becoming is the continuity, isn't it? I want to go into um, becoming. Uh-huh. I'm becoming. Becoming what? I'm becoming noble. Well, that's the thing. I'm becoming wiser. I'm becoming less angry. I'm becoming more rich. I'm becoming uh, full of words. <laughs> I'm becoming uh, gorgeous. I'm becoming more beautiful. I'm becoming lovely. I... Right? No, this, please, this is very important. Don't just accept. I'm not interested in your accepting it, please. I, you see, becoming and being. Is there anything, I'm questioning it, I'm saying there is not. Is there anything that says, I'm being? Or you know, we are always moving, becoming something, a movement forward, or movement from backward to forward. So in becoming, there is always uncertainty, right? Huh? Ah. Huh? In becoming, there. I've just begun, lady. I've just begun. <laughs> In becoming, there is always uncertainty. I may not become the. Uh, Whatever it is. In becoming, there's great insecurity. Right? Which is fear. Hmm? Which is fear. Fear. Fear, I said, uncertainty is fear. Uncertainty, insecurity. And therefore, I go off seeking security. And there, I say, I must be secure there. I don't know if you're following all this, right? But uh, just to please say, I'm becoming something. I don't think it's only we who say, I'm becoming. I'm becoming a good engineer. Hmm? Or I may not. And even if I do become a good, very good engineer, I might not get a job. Right? So in becoming, there is this sense of fear, uncertainty, insecurity. Hmm? That only applies for us. I mean, the tree doesn't say. I'm and then I'm talking human beings. The tree. Don't bring in the tree when I'm talking about you. So. 
So we say ending and becoming. This is our life. The ending we call death, hmm? becoming we call living. Oh, you don't understand. I have passed from the first grade to second grade, third grade, fourth grade, co- school. I have finished with school. Now I intend to college, and then I go. If I am lucky enough to get into college, then I go to university. From university on to become a clerk or a lawyer, and then I become the chief justice or the chief executive or the vice president or the foreman, the shopkeeper. <laughs> Stop shop steward. That's what talk a great deal about it. Hmm? Right? So all my life I am becoming something. If I'm pushed pushed in that direction, I go in that direction. If I'm pushed in that direction, so push, influence, pull, driven. Right? Poor, you're poor people. Well, come on, sir. Hmm? So, what is death? So, death is an ending of becoming. And I have learned a great deal. I have accumulated a great deal of wealth, a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of experience, a great deal of technological knowledge. I have worked, I have saved, I have collected uh, antiques, I have collected books, I have collected knowledge, I am becoming, becoming, gathering. Mm. And there is an ending when I die to all that. So I am frightened. No? So, huh? Why? Because I'm used to it. I won't. That's my life. That's called living. Why should I end it? So the Hindus, the ancient Hindus said, quite right. You are always becoming. Mm-hmm. So, if you die, next life you will become something. You follow? Next life, if you have been very good, if you have been kind, if you have been generous, if you have been something in this life, and there is death, which is the ending of this life, and if you have been excellent in your life, you will have a better life next life, which is called reincarnation. Do you understand? To reincarnate, to incarnate, to born. Right? Whole of Asia believes this. You may laugh at it, say, what silly! Hmm? But there is a great deal of reality in it. I'm not using truth, but a great deal of reality in it, which I won't go into, because it's too complex for you. Please forgive me. And Christians believe in what they call resurrection, you know, to be re-resurrected. So there it is. And the, Greek, and the Greeks believed in some form or no form. The Romans said, this is only one life, let's have a good time. <laughs> let's drink and be merry. And so every human being throughout the world is afraid of this terrible thing called ending. Also, 
the consequences of what may happen when they die. Uh? Also, the consequences of what may happen after they have died. Yes, I, consequences. I left my wife alone. Hmm? Well, uh, no, I mean, uh, when, you, when you say that the Christians believe in uh, heaven and hell and things of that sort, uh, when you say fear of death, uh, doesn't fear also come into it that uh, you're wondering, have I done well in this life? Will I go to heaven or hell and all that? Yes, that's what we're saying, sir. That is, Christians believe in heaven and hell. If you have behaved properly, believed in whatever they believe in, and sitting, then you will sit next to the God hmm, in a cloud. That's heaven, whatever it is. Muslims believe heaven is having a very good time with a lot of women and girls or boys and whatever it is. And the Hindus say no. They're a little more clever, <laughs> a little more. They, they had good brains in those days. They said, well, human beings are ugly human people anyhow, and to civilize them there must be fear, hmm? and fear is one of the things that will control them. So they say, well, if you behave properly now, next life you'll have a good time. You'll have more houses, more whatever it is. Or you will, if you are a religious person, you'll get nearer and nearer God. Right now, we have described the whole attitude, the activities, the realities of ending, which is called death. Hmm? Right? Now, just listen carefully. Listen, listen. We have described, right? I have described to you the mountain, hmm? see, or I have described to you what it, how to play tennis. How, actually, I don't show it to you. I am describing it to you, how to hold a racket, hmm? how to take left hand, right hand. I have shown it to you, I have described it to you in words. But the actuality of playing tennis is different. Right? From the description. You follow? Hmm? Now, what is the. Um, after describing it, now you face the, the, the reality of it, the actuality of it. That is, can you end each day? Your worries, your jealousies, your hurts, your everything, and each day your cunningness, your vanity, your, uh, you know, everything, your moods, your. Can you? Do you want to? I think we would want to, but uh, it doesn't necessarily happen. Ah, if you want to something, it does happen. No. Ah, yes, sir. If I want to find out, if I want to be rich, I go at it. I work at it. I deceive. I do everything to get rich, because I want to be rich. Oh, my dozens of aspects. Tunki, I've explained to you very carefully the whole picture. I can add more to it, lots more. But that is the picture. Hmm? We said the picture is not the real. Hmm? The shadow cast by a tree is not the real tree, it's the shadow. 
So I have described to you the whole business of ending and all that, which is generally called death. That is a description, that is the shadow. That is the I'm reading in a book how to hold a tennis racket. But to play it, you have to go on the court, take a racket, play it. Right? So, will you <laughs> do it? Will you go out and play tennis? Will you go out? And will you say that is shadow? And I'm look, go and find out what the tree is like. I climb it. I look at it. So this morning I have. I am learning a great deal about what human beings call living, hmm? right? And why, why human beings, including myself, which are all human beings, all of us, why we are so frightened of ending, and we never said what does it mean to end. Hmm? What does it mean to become, 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 become more beautiful, more this, more that? You follow? Consumer society. So I've described all this to you. Will you be satisfied with the description? Hmm? Will you say yes, that's very nice. I like the shadow better than the tree. <laughs> I cling to the shadow. I'll hold on. And I insist the shadow must be left. And when the sun goes in the other direction, I'm lost. You follow? <laughs> so what will you do? This is part of your education. Part of your learning what life is. They won't talk to you this about all this if you go to an old, to a school, to a college, to a university, or to a church, or to a guru, to a psychologist. This is your life. What? It's quite interesting, but first of all... What do you mean interesting? <laughs> well, I want to trip you up. You are full of... What do you mean interesting? It's a real thing. It's not real. If it is interesting, what do you mean? How to end? Are you asking that to me? Yes. I mean, I, I noticed uh, and, and at the end of the day, if I still have something in mind, I couldn't do. To, to of course, that's out. what I'm saying. Would if you, Tunki, Tunki, suppose you're vain. Hmm? Suppose, I'm not saying you're vain, or you think you're a guru, <laughs> hmm? or that you're going to be a guru, or have the feeling that you're going to be a guru. And see if you can end that feeling this evening. See what happens. <laughs> See what happens. If I set myself as a guru, 
You know what a guru is, don't you? One of those ugly birds, ugly people. If I set myself up as a guru, and I am full of, you know, I am enlightened, I am supreme, I am God, I am, I know everything about everything. You follow? I am the guru. And I go to the guru and say, oh boy, see what happens if you end <laughs> all your feeling of being a guru at the end of the day. Do you know what he would do with me? He would throw me out. No? It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> you ask why? I'm telling him, or telling you, or telling any of us, I'm telling if you're vain, hmm, you understand, vain, arrogant, uh, feeling of superiority, feeling that you're somebody, at the end of the day, see, or any day, any moment, drop it and see what happens. So learning is not a continuous movement, it's ending each lesson. Ah, you don't see. Ending each reaction, each experience, each look. So that your eyes when you have seen it, finish and look again. You'll see it much more. Can I add something a little bit off on this? Huh? I, I have a question, but it's a little bit off. Doesn't matter. <coughs> One thing that's intrigued me is to see a very old person suddenly take interest in taking care of their body. When, when you know they'll be dead in two or three years. <laughs> you know, poor chap, you'll, yes. So what, what role does uh, Probably, he says, probably somebody has told me must get well or something. I don't know. I know a man who started doing yoga at the age of seventy. Hmm? Who chap should have done when he, when he was thirty. Now he, he can, and he's very proud, he can stand on his head. After a couple of years he could stand on his head and he felt terribly proud. I said, what an ass he is, at the age of seventy, doing standing on his head and feeling proud about it. You follow? So I'm asking you, you learn something, Mathematics two and two four. You can't drop that, can you? <laughs> and say, so, well, next morning I'm going to find out if two and two make four. <laughs> Something wrong with your brain, <laughs> right? So you know, you cannot drop technological knowledge, right? Then. Once well, I drop uh, my cycling and learn all over again cycling, <laughs> the next morning you won't learn all over again because you know how to cycle. So we are talking of something entirely different, which is the psychological inward ending. I'm attached to you, my wife, my mother, my son. My brother, attached, hold, cling, depend, and see if I, what happens if I drop my dependency. Will I lose my love? You following all this? This question arises in my mind when you say, "See what happens if I drop my dependency." You are free, that's all. Nothing happens except you are thrown off a burden. 
But it seems this thing is very persistent. Ah, then you haven't dropped it. Then you don't want to drop it. And you like it. Keep it. <laughs> what, what makes us not want to drop? Because you like it. It's more pleasurable to have something to cling to. Yes, but that's a fact. How is one to look at that fact? Look at? That is a fact that it's more pleasurable to me to hold on to that image. Yes. Why do you hold on to it? For it's pleasure. Hmm? Well, sec security? What do you mean by security? Is there security in some dead thing? And I'm holding on to that. I'm a Hindu, or whatever it is. I hold on to that. An idea, hmm? a formula, a tradition, a conditioning, which is which is something imposed, held, or hold, which holds my mind to, and all the rest of it. But I drop it. And at the end of that day, I say, wake up the next morning, say, oh, extraordinary. I'm none of those things. I'm free. There's a freedom. And I can look. Oh, well, you. <laughs> Can you, I'm asking you, Tunki, if you have some particular pleasure, hmm, can you drop it? I like, uh, when I'm in India, I'm used to Indian food. And, uh, you know, many Indians find it terribly difficult <laughs> to drop their food and start some, some other kind of food. South India, there was... The, there was a famine at one time. South Indians eat a great deal of rice. And the government, I believe, sent some wheat. And they wouldn't touch it. There are several reasons why they wouldn't touch it, because it upset their digestion, their habits, and so on. I'm just showing extraordinarily difficult for people who are both biologically as well as psychologically, to drop something and t start anew. Yes. Have you noticed something? I'll show you something. <coughs> when you are in the kitchen, in the dining room, you're always licking your fingers, right? Not all the time. When you touch something, you lick it. Don't you? Hmm? Hmm? Right? Have you noticed it? What if you do it? Right? And you pick up something else with that. After licking your fingers, you go and pick up a salad. And I come along, pick up what you have already touched. Right? Right? I pick up your spittle. Right? Have you noticed this? Hmm? Come on, have you noticed it? So, can you drop that habit? Never do it, because it's, it's unhygienic, unhealthy, and ugly. Right? Or do you think it's lovely? It's a beautiful act. Lick your fingers and pick up something. <laughs> wait, wait, Tunki, I'm on. <laughs> Tunki is always with something else. I won't stick to one thing. Can you drop that habit? See the reason of it. Unhygienic? Hmm? I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> eat your spittle, eat your uh, microbes, I have my own microbes, <laughs> I don't want you, I have my own, I want to keep them to myself, I don't want to give it to you. 
see the reason of it. Right? I see all of you do it. And I, very careful, I will never touch that which you have already, <laughs> from, which you have taken, because I don't want to, etc. Et so there is a habit which you, every human, in Europe, especially in this Western world, they do it. Man picks up a magazine, picks it and flicks his finger. And I, I won't touch it. Right? Will you drop it? <laughs> Not but <bust>, to gay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking to you if you don't do it because you are you are you are Eastern minded. They are there because of hygienic reasons and religious reasons. All kind, which began really a, for a hygiene, said, "Don't do it. It's un- you can't do such things." I was going to say, I think somebody, uh, our friend, is an apple being fired from one mouth to the other. And then, then, no, no. <laughs> then, then don't I mean, talk about it. Don't go into all that. But for, for them, it's, it's a, an act of friendliness. I, I, I don't look. I was once invited by a Muslim family. You know what Muslims are? They knew I was a strict vegetarian, so they didn't cook, didn't have meat. But they had, they invited me, and we sat around the table, and there was this huge pile, there were about ten of us or fifteen of us, huge pile of rice, vegetables, everything cooked in one big pile, heap. No, watch it. I'm going to show you something. And there were about ten of us. And no spoons, no forks. We had to eat from that food, put it into our mouth. Wait. That's considered brotherliness, equality. They believe in that. So, I sat here, and another man said, each of us took carefully a little bit, so that there was a wall of rice and vegetables between each person. You understand? (laughs) Now, will you drop this habit? Will you? Drop it. Not say, but uh, uh, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Well, in this particular case, you can explain the reasons. You've mentioned hygiene, question of sensitivity to other people. That seems perfectly clear and easy to drop such a habit. But in the case of attachment to one... No, one I'm, I'm taking that one thing. I'm taking that one thing. Because I see this at every meal. I remember once staying, living in a French house, and there was a cook there, and he used to taste it <laughs> and pass it to the other cook, and together, and the same spoon they put it back, and they brought up the soup, <laughs> and I couldn't touch it. <laughs> no, this goes on all. Wait, Togi, <laughs> will you kindly? For me, at least, <laughs> drop this. This unhygienic habit. If now wait a minute, if you see this mm, as ugly thing, really see it, you won't do it. You will catch yourself. Going <laughs> Your fingers go into your mouth. You can't say, but I won't do it. Watch it. Be aware of it. Look at your fingers going up. I, you know, I watch a man who resisted smoking. He said he didn't want to smoke. I used to watch him. And every, two, every minute or so he would put his hand in his pocket. 
bring it out, and the other hand matches, and suddenly realize what he was doing, <laughs> and drop it. <laughs> I'll watch you at lunch. <laughs> Now, in the same way, you want to find out more serious things, which is, you want to find out what, what is ending, the ending of something. So that your mind is always fresh, you understand? What time is it? Ten to one. Oh. We haven't really gone into more deeply into the question of what is death. It's very. It requires a great deal of attention, a great deal of understanding yourself to find out what it means to die. And you ask, what, what is meditation? Hmm? As are you are you interested in meditation? Any of you? Except mm, Shakuntala, I'm careful. Mm? Except perhaps one or two others. Are you interested in it? You know, have you ever, first of all, have you ever sat very quietly by yourself? Have you? If you have, have you watched your eyes? whether they are moving up and down, watching flies and watching lizards, watching the birds, or your eyes also are very quiet. You can keep them open, but very quiet. And have you, if you are sat very quietly under a tree or in your room, or lying down in your bed. <coughs> Have you watched your thought chasing each other? <laughs> huh? One thought after another, right? Like an endless chain. And you have you ever asked why this goes on? One word after another, one symbol after another, one picture, one image after another, and thought moving, circling, going on and on and on. Hmm? Have you? Have you found out why? And have you found out what would happen if there is little gap between two thoughts? It's too difficult, isn't it? Nelson, not difficult. All right. Will you? You and I will talk. Go into this, do you want to? 
Have you noticed? If you have an interval, if there is a gap, not one continuous thread of thought, hmm? as with most people, there's never a gap, never an interval. Always one thought ends and immediately another. Hmm? Now, can that? What happens in that gap? What happens, what takes place in that, in the cessation of one thought before another thought begins? Have you ever watched it, Wilson? Or is your thought uh, like a string without any break? Hmm? How does this gap come about? No, 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 have you watched it? I said, not come about. First watch it. For, have you ever had that space between two thoughts? It seems as though listening and seeing becomes huh? clearer. What? It seems as though listening and seeing becomes clearer. I don't understand. If there is a gap? Well, if it's quieter. No, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. I'm asking you. Is is your thinking a continuous movement, like a thread in which there is no break or a knot after knot after knot? After knot. One constant movement. And if there is an interval, if there is a break before next thought begins, what is that interval? You that interval may be ten minutes or a second. But what happens in that interval? Tunki, darling, Tunki, find out. I am asking you, Tunki, whether your thinking is like a piece of thread, horizontal or vertical, without any break, or with few knots <laughs> in that thread. Have you watched your thing? It's, it's a hazy, it's not, when we don't do anything, it's, it's not operating that clear. I mean, Are you daydreaming? Yes. So you are daydreaming, hmm? right? Which means you are really thinking, but you are not conscious of it. You are dreaming. You sit down and look at the clouds and say, that's nice, I, that tree is nice, and oh, that's a nice car, what car is that? That's uh, mm, the Mercedes, or the Ford, or this, or that. Oh, I have long hair, short hair, I must go to the barber, I must <laughs> polish my shoes, I must go to bed early, I must, uh, um, I'm hurt, I'm <laughs> all the time going, going, going. Or, see, watching your thinking, looking at it, not trying to control it, shape it, or trying to find out there is an interval, <laughs> but just watching it. First of all, can you watch your own thinking? Close it, open it, no. put a band. No, no. So, what relation does that have with 
I said to you, because if you keep your eyes open, you are apt to look at things. If you keep your eyes closed, and isn't that you are enclosed. Do it anyway. I don't make... You know, there is a story, which is a nice story, of a guru with a lot of disciples. Every morning, the guru sat down with his disciples to meditate. And his favourite cat would come and sit in his lap, because it's nice and warm. <laughs> and the guru said, the nuisance, so he used to take the cat out and tie him, tie him to him. Pose. And when the guru died, the disciples had to find a cat and tie it before they could meditate. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm asking you, have you watched your thinking? I watched that car go by. It was a blue car. Can I watch my thought in the same way as it moves from one thing to another? And if it does, find out if it can end. Instead of being a long thread, break it. <laughs> See what happens. Can you break a thought? And say, well, that's enough. Enough is enough. And just end that thought. And see what happens before the next, next thought is waiting. <laughs> before it springs on you, watch it. In that space, in that in, in interval, what happens? Right? It's time to stop. If I was a guru, you would pay me fifty dollars or fifty pounds every day. <laughs>